Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Retail Doctor Group webinar, State of the Nation, where we will talk through uh, what we're seeing globally and locally uh, in retail. And we'd love to welcome our guest speakers this morning to take you through what they're seeing um, and some of the changes in our legislation, tax, rental, um, and HR policies. Um, so to begin with, I, I would like to welcome our speakers. So we have Dominique Lamb, uh, CEO of the National Retail Association and who we have just welcomed as the chairperson of Retail Doctor Group. We've got Dominique giving us an introduction to national retail this morning, followed by Stephen Demancy, um, General Manager of Retail and Operations at Kathmandu, is gonna give us an overview of what's happening in the retail community through COVID. Simon Fontaine, Managing Director of uh, Lease Info, is gonna give us a leasing and property update. And then Belinda, Belinda McPhee, HR Consulting Director um, at Track HR. And Joel Hummel, Chartered Accountant, who's going to take us through the government stimulus packages for Wheeler Grenfell. Um, and throughout, we are going to allow Q&A. So if you do have any questions for our speakers, if you want to put them in the Q&A panel, um, we will be asking cute questions at the end at 9.30. Um, but feel free, if they're directed at a specific speaker, put them into the Q&A as we go through. We'll also be asking some polls this morning, um, looking at how retailer sentiments changed. So Retail Doctor Group, through its Insights Division, ran a retailer sentiment study um, a few months ago, and we're looking at doing an update at the moment, so we would love to have your opinions. So we'll be asking them as poll questions at various points um, this morning. Um, you can participate or not, it's completely up to you. Um, it would be great to get some insights from our community. So firstly, I would like to welcome Brian Walker, CEO and founder of Retail Doctor Group, um, to give us a bit of a global overview. Morning, Brian. Good morning, Anastasia, and good morning, everyone. And thanks very much to our speakers. Uh, we're delighted to have you with us um, today. This is the seventh edition, and what's been always the ethos of this work together has been to help retailers through this COVID period and through, uh, through and beyond, so the rebounding. And so, um, particular thanks to everyone involved. We like to start these sessions, as you know, by reaching out to our global network, the Ebeltoft Group, where we have colleagues and partners uh, around the world. And we like to get a bit of a snapshot to see exactly what's going on in home countries. And essentially, it provides context for where we find ourselves. And so when we look at um, our friends in Brazil and so forth in Canada, we see, uh, generally speaking, uh, a broadening and reopening of the retail sector. Um, there are fairly strict rules regarding to locality, distance and so forth, not dissimilar to stage three and two lockdowns here in Australia. Um, limitations on gatherings, physical retail, government assistance in some cases is consistent with Australia's model. Um, but of course, as I'll touch on, we see different channels experiencing strong growth uh, and others clearly struggling. So we wait to see where that takes us. What was interesting too was that when we started to look at consumers and this idea of new channels and new methods of, of shopping, we saw that 75% of consumers tested globally, if you like, through the Ebeltoft group showed us that they were in fact looking at an increased degree of um, almost promiscuity around brands, new shopping methods, different brands, different retailers, different websites, um, moving also increased focus on private label and so forth. And when we speak to clients, we're increasingly looking at the way retailers use time. And you'll hear me talk about time well used and time well spent. And so we're seeing the growth in online fulfillment service models, contactless retail, as very strong examples of time well used and increasingly retailers with physical stores open, thinking about the time well spent space. Uh, and the others such as Stephen and Simon, uh, will talk more closely to the coalface of how retailers are adapting through this. We also see that availability, convenience and value are the strongest drivers of new brand uh, purchases. But what was interesting here was that if we look close quickly at this, we see that health and hygiene has really, and obviously enough, uh, a very strong part of the retailer's makeup 
It, it was certainly uh, a hygiene factor, if you like, pre-COVID. Now it's very much a competitive positioning to ensure that we've got good hygiene uh, regulations and standards and consistency, social distancing and so forth. So that's a must for all retailers to be very overt about that in the physical space. In stock products, of course, availability, and we've seen the rushes and that continues throughout the world at the moment. Uh, high convenience level, better prices and promotions and so forth. So there's some of the, the really key pieces. And also, naturally enough, a resurgence of the community and high street shopping. Uh, and what are we doing with time? Well, here's from, uh, from Neil and our friends in the US. Uh, what we're seeing is Americans, as an example, are changing how they spend time. And I think you'll see a, a mirror reflection in, uh, in Australian consumer time. And we actually see it, funnily enough, in the increase in home-related products, in retail, which I'll touch on shortly, the, the rad, dramatic increase in streaming and live, live services. So in this example, we see cooking, home improvement, streaming, uh, exercising, live news, the way people are using more time, and a nice net increase in the use of social media. We've recently also conducted a study into how consumer behaviours are changing. So we completed this study last week and it was asking Australian consumers, um, where do you prefer to shop? And I think what was very interesting here, we were asking them, do you prefer to shop online? Do you prefer to shop in store? Do you prefer to utilise click and collect? Um, we're very much seeing a rise in click and collect with 8% of consumers now saying they actually prefer to use click and collect in store. Um, and we'll see some figures later about the, the actual usage. 26% um, now also saying that they prefer to shop online and get it delivered. Um, but we're still seeing 67%, the large proportion of our consumers still saying, even at the moment, they prefer to visit the physical stores. So the physical stores are still going strong in the consumer minds we can see. <laughs> Where we have a, have a quick look, so this was looking at Australian consumers. Um, we've excluded Victoria um, due to the lockdown, but it's looking at where they have been purchasing in the last month. Um, so we can see that still large shopping centre is at the forefront. But we've very much seen an increase in local community shopping centres and standalone stores. Um, and we can see that this is a, a trend that's looking to continue with consumer behaviours very much a rise in the marketplace. So we can see eBay marketplace, 25% um, of consumers have used it within the last month. But also what was quite standing out here is this rise of click and collect again. So 18% of the Australian population saying that they have used this within the last month. So we very much see in the change of behaviors across these shopping channels. Um, and at Retail Doctor Group, we do a lot on consumer personality profiling. So we would definitely be recommending to dig further into these specifically for your target segments. But when we look at a broad um, overview of the general consumer in the market, we can really see what their preference is for purchase panels. And we asked the question, where do you expect to continue over the next 12 months? Um, you know, what will you continue using? And we can see it's fairly steady for most Channels, so local community shopping centres, very steady. But again, showing this growth in intended use in local strip malls and standalone stores. So we're definitely seeing a shift in where consumers are, are looking to, to purchase. And if we dig a little bit into click and collect, so we, we asked consumers, um, what channels have you used in the last 12 months? Um, and it was seen that one in three consumers have used Click and Collect in the last 12 months. And we dug a bit deeper because we did find this, this rise of Click and Collect. We now see a lot of Australian retailers opening these services. Uh, I mean, Bunnings being the big example of launching Click and Collect during COVID. Um, so it's very much becoming a normality for consumers. Uh, and when we looked at, do you intend to continue? We see that it's something that will continue into normality when uh, when life returns. Um, and so looking at what are the particular categories that they're interested in. So very much in the, the food, fresh food, liquor, pantry, takeaway food, 
but still quite high up there, six and seven percent for clothing, accessories, and electronics. So we really can see that consumers uh, are interested in this methodology. So it's understanding how how do we bring this into our offer? Is this in particular useful for us? And and again, I come back to this target segments. Who is your customer target segment? Um, and then is it relevant for them? So we're looking at a broader brush, high level Australian consumer here, um, but we can dig deeper to really look at these personality segments and see what are they looking for. As we've tracked, thanks Anastasia, as we've tracked Australian retail in particular through this whole process and, and doing this insights work along, we've certainly seen naturally enough a movement into online, but largely driven by obviously the COVID factor. What we see is the underlying returning strength to the physical asset. And that's consistent when you look close, more closely at some of these results. Um, it was interesting to, to look at Australian retail results that have just come in. And JB Hi-Fi are interesting because they had a 20% growth in the EBIT. And what was interesting about their growth numbers and their revenue line was that up until March, 92, 93% of their business thereabouts was in their physical stores. And that's consistent with all these other brands. And so the 67% is interesting, but I take that as being very COVID impacted upon and do prepare to strategize for physical retail to return. Um, Simon will talk, um, I'm sure, about the long term of the assets and shopping centers and where that's all heading. But as you've often heard me say, the human condition is to be social. The instinct is to be in physical environments. Um, and so we really start to look at this buying shopping divide. But quickly and interestingly, we look at businesses like Adairs, Nick Scarly, returning greater dividends to their shareholders, um, driven somewhat and openly by rental abatements and by government assistance in JobKeeper. That's a consistent theme in this last few months. We looked at the Woolworths results uh, and we see strong, strong growth in sales through this period, driven by the April, May spike. So in summary, and everyone would know this, two great divides, if you like, into the Australian retail scene at the moment. I'm sure Dominic will pick up on this. And that is home, home-related products, um, both physical and online, have seen rapid growth and some retailers reporting their best ever periods. Harvey Norman is another one that comes to mind. Kogan is another one. Conversely, fashion, and I'm delighted to have Stephen Dominacy with us National Retail Manager for Kathmandu to talk about how it's been as a predominantly apparel-based retailer um, and the adaptation and innovation he and the team have taken through. But again, two camps, that's a harder place to play in. And so we wanna turn our attention to helping our retail friends through that space as well. Thanks, Fantastic, you. thanks Brian. So I've just quickly launched um, a poll to the audience just before we welcome our next um, speaker. So if anyone is uh, out there and see it coming up, we would really appreciate um, responses. And as I say, as Retail Doctor Group, we will be sharing the results um, in an updated white paper with our whole community um, probably next week. Fantastic. And so a couple of innovations there while we have the post, I'll let Brian continue. Uh, this is again from our friends in uh, Ebeltoft and we've gone out again as you, as you would anticipate and looked at some quick examples of retail adaptation. And by the way, we have a, a full deck of all this work available. So come back to us at retaildoctor.com.au and we'll happily share it. This is Burberry. Um, so Burberry very much using their, it's a 5,800 5, square foot or 580 square meter food store. A food store is designed for customers to interact with products in person and on social media. So all stock, uh, QR coded, scanned, showing information on the customer's digital screen. Becoming increasingly um, common, I suppose, for want of a better term, and an interesting use of digital. Here, of course, we've got the unmanned stores increasingly becoming common around the world, visas, uh, sorry, sensors, uh, laser security and so forth, and the idea that it's unstaffed, contactless. This is interesting from Marcos in Brazil, increase of honest markets through the metro areas. So this relies on customer honesty, highly transparent, um, interesting, and again, a form of adaptation. 
Dengo, which is live stream conversation with stores direct from a physical mall. So thinking about the customer journey, the store acting almost effectively as a dry store with a seamless digital contact streaming through. And it does compel sort of uh, in, a, in an unusual way, a high level of personalization. This is uh, Romania. Restaurants have started working with robots. So the start of robotics functioning as waiters. So there we are. That's one way of getting around COVID. This is Albert Hintz from uh, Romania, back in shape. But this is a collaboration between a fitness platform champ and the supermarket chan channel, uh, Albert Hain. And it's temporary fitness subscriptions are sold through the supermarket channel, getting people, sorry, getting people from the Netherlands back in shape after sitting at home for a while. For those who are interested and, and involved with social change, Ben and Jerry's, the ice creamery business, are leading the movement for social change. If you go onto their sites in the US, you see a huge push around change. Some of the social, particularly some of the social causes and, and deeply ingrained issues in the US. And Ben and Jerry's are leading social change. This is Hoka and Snapchat. It's the use of artificial reality. And that's simply uh, by using AR. I'm able, or in this case, this lady is able to vision out how those shoes will look on her feet uh, without physically touching them from the US and expect to see more of that in the next few years. Fantastic. So that's a snapshot. So, so what we're seeing is retailers adapting and innovating. We have a lot more content. Time will beat us, but we're more than happy to share with you. Um, Anastasia, I'd like to welcome Dominique, Dominique Lamb. So thank you, Dominique, for joining us. Dominic is the CEO of the National Retail Association and also our new chairperson for Retail Doctor Group, uh, which we're absolutely delighted about. Um, and I've asked Dominic to come in today and talk to us from her perspective as the head of the National Retail Association, an overview of Australian retail, what's happening, where it's happening, and some of the key takeouts that Australian retailers uh, should be considering in this period. Thank you so much. It's um, a pleasure to be here and, and to be part of the team. Um, I've spent a bit of time speaking to everybody this week um, that is part of the Retail Doctor team and I have been incredibly impressed with um, just their passion and um, dedication to the industry, um, which is, is really wonderful to see, especially at a time like this. I guess um, for retailers, you know, much of what you know, Brian and Anastasia have just spoken about it is absolutely true. I mean, it, it's a very interesting time in retail where we're seeing lots of different um, retailers pivot. We're certainly seeing that rise of online and, and where businesses haven't, um, I guess, invested in that digital space. You know, there, there is quite huge investment in that space at this time. I guess in terms of a category perspective, not much has changed in the sense that, you know, consumers are definitely, you know, focused on hibernation. They're focused on nesting. They're not going out as much. They are taking up different types of hobbies. And so those categories of retail that are doing particularly well, um, certainly around homewares and, and just creating this um, almost oasis within your home um, has been really um, prominent, um, but also the outdoor activity space. So, you know, people like BCF are reporting quite significant increases um, in, in, in their profits because, you know, people want to get out and about, they want to go hiking, you know, they want to go on adventure um, within domestic limits, obviously with so many of our borders closed. The big things that of course have been really problematic for our retailers is that we know that um, lockdown causes quite significant loss for our retailers. So nationally, we lost about $3.6 billion um, as an industry solely as a result of lockdown. And now um, at the moment, you know, we very much are watching what's happening in New South Wales and in Victoria just to determine how long that's going to go on for, um, you know, whether the restrictions are going to be dropped, all of those kinds of things. And last night we were, we were lucky enough to be involved in a telephone call with the Victorian government. And it looks like there will be some form of announcement um, on Sunday, which will be a, a graduated approach in terms of the reduction of restrictions. And of course, um, for us, where there is an essential services list that many retailers fought to get on, um, we will continue to work with the government around what that would look like. So very much for retailers at this time, I think front of mind has absolutely been this concept of safety, what it looks like from a hygiene perspective. We've had the hot debate around masks, 
whether or not, you know, nationally you ask consumers to wear masks, whether you provide masks, certainly Apple has taken that approach um, where they are providing masks to everybody that does enter their store, as well as having all of their staff wear masks as well. Um, and that is something that I think will continue for some time because, you know, not only are our retailers in a position where most work cover um, legislation across the country now holds them liable if somebody does, you know, contract COVID within a workplace without questioning where they got it. Um, but, you know, they want to keep their workers safe. And, and I guess in this time when we think about safety in retail, the other thing that's really become front of mind has been crime. So we've seen a significant impact in increasing crime across the country, particularly where there have been things like panic buying, um, lockdowns or spikes in cases. We know that in some instances there's been an increase of up to 100% um, in retail crime and that includes things like assaulting workers, it includes theft, uh, it includes customer abuse as well and of course we know that retail workers are reporting that 85% of them experience customer abuse almost on a daily basis and, and this has led to some movements from people like Woolworths now to have two badges, you know, I'm someone's daughter, I'm someone's brother, I'm someone's son, all those kinds of things, um, which has been, you know, a, a not such a big shift for retail, because I think that, you know, as an industry, we're very empathetic, and we've certainly worked quite closely with our employees around mental health, especially employing so many young people. But now more than ever, um, our relationship with police has grown quite significantly, because it simply has had to during this particular time, which has been really tough. The hot topics still for retailers at this time remain around leasing and industrial relations. Certainly we have leasing codes across the country, um, but at this time, most of them are due to end in September and there is a, you know, a lot of toing and froing around whether that's going to be extended depending on where it is. Victoria, of course, have extended and they've also implemented a hardship um, fund for landlords, particularly small landlords, so family investor landlords, because what we're finding in dispute is that many of these, you know, super fund invested strip shops, small shopping centres, simply don't have the ability to continue to fund rental waivers. So they're getting into a stalemate debate, um, you know, with landlord and tenant where it's just simply not going anywhere and isn't to the benefit of either industry being property or for retail. So it has been pretty tough. Um, certainly we've seen Centre Group's uh, results come out last week. So they've lost $3.6 billion during this period, just in the three months. Um, so it's an interim loss. So the expectation is that obviously will be more significant. And all of that has impacts on things like, you know, costs moving forward, what they're going to charge tenants, whether they invest in construction, all of those kinds of things, which what we want to avoid, of course, is having these malls that have, you know, vacancies as well as, you know, dated wares and, and simply are not, um, you know, cohesive with making sure that people come back and feel safe in our centres. Across the country, we know that about 80% of retailers have returned to opening, even where they can trade. Um, however, in CBDs, it has been less depending on what government departments are doing with their workers and what the foot traffic's been like. But in most areas, it's sitting at about 60%, unless you're in complete lockdown in Victoria. That has been very, very problematic. Um, obviously for the foot traffic numbers and simply, you know, making it viable for retailers to trade in those locations. And of course, tourism areas continue to be um, heavily impacted, especially in those regions. Um, and that is something that seems that government, state governments in particular are very focused on. Um, the federal government seems to be doing everything that they can do uh, to move that along. But the stimulus that, that is out there at the moment is very much around JobKeeper, um, and other things. Um, and whilst JobKeeper is now changing and, and becoming less, um, the expectation is that we are going to see consumer confidence drop and, and likely that um, also spending um, is going to be impacted. And of course, we're moving into Christmas. So this is where watching what happens in terms of numbers, particularly in Victoria and New South Wales is crucial because of course, for Christmas, both of those states are our highest spending consumers in the country. So we need them to ensure that they are able to have Christmas, that they are able to plan Christmas. And of course, you know, even when we look at jobs and things like that, we have to acknowledge the fact that at the moment, the federal government are predicting we'll have 2 million unemployed people shortly. Um, and as that occurs, of course, discretionary spending is likely to be compromised. Um, but in saying that, 
we also, I think from an advocacy perspective, need to encourage businesses to be able to employ people. And we know unfortunately that retailers are saying only 1% of them are looking to rehire at this time. And of course, with most young people having lost their jobs, that is likely to be directly in our industry. And that kind of brings us to our industrial relations space. The Prime Minister has commissioned five key committees in that space that are looking at things like casual and part-time work. They're looking at enterprise bargaining, certainly simplification of awards, amongst other things. Um, the issue, of course, is that there are five employee unions and five employer unions on those groups, plus advisors. And so it's pretty slow going, but they're hoping to have an outcome um, by October. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what that process looks like. Um, and you know what comes out of of that, and whether or not we see, you know, something similar to JobKeeper, as 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 been has been discussed in the media, certainly around something like a small business award or a small business schedule or something along those lines to really help business continue to employ long after JobKeeper goes. Because right now, I think most of us are really watching that March period, that post Christmas crunch to see you know, whether our consumers spend at Christmas, whether it's enough to get many of our brands through. Um, but certainly at this time, I think from a planning perspective, most of, most of money and funding and focus has certainly been around digital because we have seen a, quite a spike in that space. But you know, as we saw with Mosaic Brands, even though they had a 14.7% increase, it wasn't enough to get them across the line, particularly with you know, their bricks and mortar stores and the numbers that they had. So, it is very much a bit of a balance at the moment. And so for us, of course, as retailers, you know, we have to make sure those bricks and mortar stores are working, which is why lockdowns are, um, are very, very problematic. Um, but I think moving forward, you know, as an industry, obviously, you know, supply chain still remains an issue for some people, um, particularly if it's all about having stock arrive in real time as is needed. Um, certainly cash seems to be a focus and people are shoring up their funds in this space, um, but also just you know that digital capability and, and probably the, the reduction of looking at um, just the floor space that the people are taking at this time. I mean, there's no doubt there are definitely vacancies and more and more of them um, popping up as we go through, but we're still unable to predict just how many retailers we're likely to lose. It's the ones that are pivoting quickly and the ones that are doing it well that will survive and will come out of this with a whole new business structure and a new business model. Um, and, and that is, I think, you know, something to definitely look for. So, I mean, if, if you're in this space, you've got to really start to pivot or move quickly with what your consumer is saying. And, and it's all about understanding exactly what they want. Good. Great summary. Dom, I was just going to ask you the interesting sort of juxtaposition where retailers are thinking about digital, investing in business information systems, point of sale, so forth. And yet, at the other hand, needing to keep cash in the business. Yeah. You know, so that, and then the need, the, the availability of capital funds is challenging at the moment. So it's a challenging position for many retailers. And, and also, finally, I'd add the need to strategize and really plan out over the next two to three years possibly yeah definitely and, and we know that the predictions in terms of recovery are looking at you know four years um you know it's going to be a long road so um you know having a strategy around what that's going to look like especially when we know that the banks are going to change their view of the world you know our safe harbor laws are you know still you know not locked in um we know that many of those personal loans and business loan deferrals will all end in september as well so um you know, there, there is a lot to be considered as to how you navigate this period. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, really appreciate the summary this morning, a wonderful summary. And, um, you know, there's a lot on the table for retailers. We would obviously say it's good to get counsel and advice in this period, there's just so much going on. Um, the interesting piece around COVID and, and the expectations of three to four years of length in one way, shape or form, um, must structurally change the marketplace. It can't help but do that. Mm, that's right. That's right. I have a couple of questions, but I'll probably go back to them and type them in if that's okay, because I know we're, we're ready for our next speaker. We're all on, on a timeline. So <laughs> you just jumped in and beat me to it there, John. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Bye.
I'm just going to quickly launch uh, our poll here. So it's a second poll. So as we welcome, um, so thank you very much, Dom. It's really appreciate. Very interesting concepts, and yeah, we'll come to the questions later. Um, and so we would then like to move to welcome Stephen uh, Demancy, uh, General Manager of Retail and Operations from Kathmandu. So to give us a bit of a retail overview of what you're seeing in um, retail at the moment. Thanks. Anastasia, thank you so much. And, and Brian, thank you for inviting me to join today. So a bit of a brief background. Kathmandu started in 1987 out of Christchurch. Our, our first store was, was in Melbourne, which is great. And over the last 30 plus years, we've grown to over 160 stores, predominantly in Australia and New Zealand. We're part of a bigger business called Kathmandu Holdings, which is listed on both Australian and New Zealand stock exchanges and and uh, we be part of that group which is also includes Ripkill which was an acquisition late last year so we, we that provider from mountain to surf which is very exciting and you know we've got uh, Ripkill just down down the road from Melbourne in Torquay um, I've been with the business just short of five years so it'll be good to talk about you know some of those learnings and um, I think the key thing for us is, is team and customer trust, uh, particularly in this area around safety. I think it's prevalent to look at both safety from a mental health perspective, as well for, as a hygiene and process piece. So I think one of the big learnings for us was very early on getting our teams into masks, making sure they were provided with masks. We were one of the few businesses along with Apple to get masks on the team and give them the tools to decide around their capacity in their stores. So the government and the state government came out with the guidance of one customer per four or five square meters. But the reality is our team managers know their stores best. So we really empowered our teams to decide on the capacity of their stores. And, you know, we averaged about one in 10 to one in 15 to even one in 20 square meters to make sure that they could run their stores efficiently and safely, not only for themselves, but for their customers. Making sure all those key basics like start of day and end of day processes are consistent throughout the entire portfolio is so important so that everyone's working towards that same process target. Uh, we touched briefly on mental health, and I think uh, being based in, in Melbourne at the moment, it, it, it's becoming a lot more prevalent um, than necessarily the, the physical safety side. So we've implemented um, uh, first aiders, mental health first aiders throughout our whole business. And um, traditionally as retailers, we'd have the physical first aiders. We've now really ramping up our, our mental first aiders so team members can can touch base with one another and, and ask them if they're doing okay. We've supplemented that with some great external support where team members can phone businesses for OCP support if they are feeling anxious or, or depressed. And you know, our main aim is to, to create strong, diverse and resilient teams. So within our own network, we've created, we've created training packs to help our teams uh, through well-being. And, and health over this time and we've we've actively pushed them to go online and and do these courses which is just so important um you know i, I think the biggest lesson throughout of all of this is just transparency and over communicating um often as as a business as a retailer you would um communicate from from b to b so from on your on your intranet or, or via email, but the reality is when some of your team are at home, the best way is to communicate from business to employee. So we've been um, using Workplace by Facebook, which essentially is um, just like our Facebook, but around um, a business and around the community, and that allows us to communicate directly with our team members, which has been fantastic. Um, you know, preempting um, government uh, news, um, getting our comms right. So we're not two or three days behind communication from Daniel Andrews. We we literally minutes behind that communication of where what we're going to do, what the next step is, what the plan is. So we constantly communicating with our team. And 
and you know creating a, a community with the team from bake-offs to competitions to making sure that the team feel engaged not only in isolation but what's happening with the rest of the business so i think that's a key a key learning um and another key one for us is just making sure that through this time as a business you don't lose track of your north star and for us being a b corp it's all about sustainability and, and a commitment not only to our customers and our teams but to sustainability so um we've you know, we're starting to charge customers for bags now, um, and that's going to support Greening Australia uh, to help revitalise, uh, obviously, the fire-ravaged parts of Australia, and, and also making sure we're committing to our suppliers. Um, we, we, we don't want to lose those relationships and cancel orders. So working very closely with our supply chain to minimise the impact on their business so we can have continuous supply of great products. So, so they, those have been some of the key learnings. Um, Brian, you and I talked about, you know, the lessons from 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 the last six months, and and Dominique, you talked about pivots. I think that's a, the, the 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 biggest used word in retail at the moment. But you 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 have to stay relevant, and and we implemented um, deliveries using Uber. So that was something quite new for us. Traditionally, we have a two to three day online delivery but we've created direct order management stores not like dark stores where they don't trade they still trade but they're allowed to, uh, we, we're getting them to deliver product via uber directly to the customer in, in a matter of hours and i think it's very important especially with the learnings of march and april to make sure you you've got alternative delivery partners up your sleeve you're creating those relationships so that you can flex depending on what, where the customer demand and, and we saw a rapid increase in online orders over that time and, and making sure that you can flex up and down and, and, and be agile, even if you're a big business, we've got 1,500 team members, is just so important. And probably the priority I've left for last is just around customer centricity. Customers want to get in and get out quickly and safely, so making sure your, your top sellers aren't necessarily at the back of the store where you'd have your bread and milk, but making sure they, they, they uh, you know, convenient and they merchandise in a way that the customer can get what they want and, and get out uh, very quickly and efficiently with ease and, and great customer service. So just making sure that we're managing our traffic flows in stores as well is important. And Stephen, some great points. And do you feel in this period that the focus on omni-channel in the business has increased? And a tactical example of that is walking into one of your stores, product not in stock, but on stock online, in stock online, and your staff members are able confidently to say, look, we'll bring it up online and we're going to deliver to you that style of operation. Is there uh, a focus on that? Yes, absolutely. I think as, as a lot of retailers, we're very functional and siloed and, and no doubt looking forward, um, understanding your data, understanding your trends, making sure you convert your customer, uh, albeit wherever, whatever channel they want to trade in is just so, so important. So we're doing a lot of work around uh, capturing sort of catchment areas and understanding both online and offline trends. And, and availability because the best, you know, we looked at your, your slide pack, availability is such a key ingredient to great customer service. And, and with the disruption in the supply chain, making sure you're keeping your customers well, giving them great advice, finding out where that product is. And, and, and we, we transfer products from WA to Sydney to make sure our customer service is, is great. But yes, you know, ensuring your digital footprint, um, both in-store and online is key. And that obviously starts with a really appealing um, online site. Stephen, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Kathmandu is a wonderful business and, and clearly transparency communication in this period. Uh, we've been very close to this catch, customer fulfillment, catchment, really looking at the data is critical. Um, like your piece on B Corp, purpose-driven organization, the North Star. So really appreciate it, fantastic. And that interesting piece around Omnichannel, 
which is a bit of a segue for, for Simon, because as we move through this, as consumers have a channel across all various channels, what does that mean for the metrics of sales per square meter and occupancy cost and the longer term as we start to move through this? Um, but very much appreciate what you've done this morning, Stephen, and thank you. And I think I might use that as an introduction to Simon Fontaine and Lease Info. Simon, thanks, Brian. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Brian. Um, Anastasia, can you do the slides or? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Brian, and um, welcome everybody. Um, for the last six State of the Nations, I've pretty much focused on short term uh, to, to cover the legislation. My topic today will cover an update on the legislation for the short term, but I want to focus our audience on some of the longer term consequences of uh, COVID-19. And as Brian stated, to start to look at the post COVID-19 leasing strategies, uh, because the, what has happened is that we know pre-COVID, the retail market was already in a cyclical and structural um, period of change. What this pandemic has done is it's compressed probably five years to seven years of change into six months. And there are very sort of structural changes, a very serious um, structural changes happening in, uh, in shopping centres in particular. And I want to focus today on some of my views as to where this might head. For the, for the purpose of giving clients um, some ideas around renewals and, and new leasing deals, and also to get what shopping centres are, you know, feeding back to me in terms of some of their strategies. So in terms of short term, um, as Dominic said, the Dominic Lamley, there is no legislative update in terms of um, each state with the exception of Victoria. So Victoria has extended uh, their, their rent relief uh, legislation. However, all other states have yet to um, make an announcement in this space. I do have some very interesting stats though on where we're at with um, disputes. I've been doing some um, research with the New South Wales Small Business Commissioner and they were good enough to sort of uh, give a, an update of where they're at. So they're handling disputes in relation to uh, Retail Leases Act. And this is an interesting set of numbers. They used to get about 200 disputes a month pre-COVID, about, about 200 disputes they were listening. They're currently up to about 250 a day. Um, and the interesting stat out of that is that they're sort of settling at mediation around 85% with, and 15% are getting what's known as certificates of no mediation, meaning that, um, that the parties can go to court. So that, those numbers indicate that um, a lot of the disputes are slowly starting to, to settle. And these are the ones that come under the, uh, the legislation. We've all heard this week about the, the uh, lockouts with Mosaic and Strand Bags. And as Brian alluded to, uh, those have been uh, settled. Uh, however, we would expect, I would expect to see more sort of, uh, I would call posturing between the part, between major sort of big retailers and landlords around this issue for uh, until such time as the market sort of stabilizes, which at this stage is unknown. Um, but what is, What's pretty clear is that landlords, by and large, I'm talking about the institutional types, are really not going to get into buying a, a rent based on um, purely tenants turnover. Um, 
And the main reason for that is that they state that the banks won't fund them because uh, they're taking on, you know, tenant or retailer risk. And whether or not that's correct or not, that is their official position. Um, and it's unlikely probably to change. So in the short term, this posturing will continue, I believe. Um, and then as Dominic stated, um, it's still, unclear as to how many stores and closures we will have. I expect to see uh, two waves of VAs, VA standing for voluntary administrations. I would expect to see um, some VAs start to occur uh, between sort of end of September, October and Christmas. And then at, you know, the, re the usual VAs sort of start again in February, if uh, Christmas, and obviously Christmas is going to be very challenging for retailers, I expect to see a second wave of VAs occurring um, in that sort of February to, uh, to June quarter. Um, so that is, I guess, the, the short term that I wanted to talk about. So uh, I, I think it's clear that we're still waiting for um, announcements from from the state governments on what they do, what they intend to do with the, uh, the code. Um, but I expect that we'll have some announcements by the end of September. So now I wanted to talk to you briefly about some major long-term structural issues for shopping centres. And as I said in my opening, about the COVID pandemic has pretty much compressed five years worth of change into six months. And some of the big questions now for, for shopping centre owners in particular is what is going to happen when 15% of online shopping um, is basically taken out of the, the, the shopping centre mix? And in the, in the short to medium term, online is going to hit 10 to 12% post lockdown. So how will that foot traffic be replaced? The next question is, what is going to happen to traditional anchors? So DDS is typically made up 18% of space for regionals and department stores made up 20%. So that's almost 40% of space um, that, is, uh, that is in a typical regional shopping center. And if you add up apparel, um, that's another 18%. So you've got almost 60% of um, retail space occupied by a category that's likely to have 15 to 25% of its expenditure uh, traveling offline. Um, and so that's a major structural uh, challenge for the shopping center and also for the retailer who is looking to uh, to invest in a, in a shopping centre um, if, if that space is uh, no longer going to be uh, productive. And the next issue is what is going to happen to cinemas? So cinemas were already structurally challenged by digital and streaming alternatives. Um, so given that um, we are now seeing a, a massive increase in streaming and online services. What will happen to the cinema entertainment space? Obviously, it won't disappear, but it will, um, it will be challenged. And what will replace and who will replace that footfall? The other um, st structural change that we are thinking about is particularly around food courts. So Brian and his team mentioned, you know, the importance of hygiene, um, social distancing. So will the 300 seat packed mega food court be sustainable? My view is for the next several years, that is not going to be um, viable anymore. So how will this space um, be remixed in, in the modern post COVID shopping center world. Another area that um, we, we're thinking increasingly about is trading hours. So 
given that the, the relies on online and the amount of actual um, cost that a retailer and a landlord has to go to retailers in terms of staff, do we actually need the trading hours that we have? Is, Friday, is Thursday night actually redundant? Can um, retailers produce the same trading in um, MAT to the retail to the landlord and the landlord to the retailer with uh, you know a more normalised trading hour, which allows both to achieve cost um, efficiencies and still deliver the same service. Then the next issue is around outgoings. Outgoings, I think, is going to be a key battleground for for both the landlord and the retailer because it currently represents 15 to 20 percent of of total occupancy cost which is a lot of money and it's no longer sustainable. So we've got huge write downs in um, shopping centers, as Dominic said, um, you know, several of the major REITs have written down their portfolios in the billions. Land tax is gonna to have to come down, uh, but also um, increasingly building owners are gonna to need to be uh, investing heavily in technology to make their their buildings energy efficient and smart so that um, outgoings and costs are, are really minimized so that 20% can be reduced to a sustainable level. Another big question for me as a sort of ec economist or property guy is this concept of the Huff gravitational model. So this is a very famous uh, economist who, who basically pioneered the work around bigger malls typically have greater pulling power than um, smaller malls, all being equal if they are equidistant. Does that model actually still apply anymore? Uh, I would argue that given the, the changes in post-COVID that the Huff gravitational model needs to be re reimagined or rethought. And I'll come to where my thoughts are on that shortly. The last area that we know is that landlords are gonna to have to spend huge amounts of money remixing their portfolios. They need to uh, spend money on, on making some space that um, we've just discussed much more productive. They need to invest in technology they need to invest in creating um, what I call a community. So what will happen to the capital available for incentives and tenant fit outs? It's another question that we've always assumed that capital will always be available. Um, but as Dominic said, that a lot of small landlords are struggling now with their funding. So how will that translate to incentives going forward? Next slide. So here's a, my take on, the, on where we're going with all this. So where I think, and this is not just my views, is there's several others in this camp, and I'll explain why I've come to this view, is that a lot of the major landlords are basically referring now to the hyper-local economy. And Brian's research has already touched on that, where he's seeing a spike in the number of local uh, visits to strip malls, to, to standalone stores. And if you look at the, carefully at this, the results of Westfield and Stockland, they no longer refer to their shopping centres as such. They refer to them as town centres and communities. And that's, there's very good reason for that, because that's where they're going. They're creating a, a local hyper community where retail will be part of a, um, a mix of office, residential, all within walking distance. So no one's working and traveling more than 30 minutes from their home. And they're creating local communities with retail as a marketplace and a hub, which when I say that's why it's back to the future, because that's where traditionally retail started from. It started in the Middle East as um, shooks, as town squares and marketplaces where people went and gathered uh, for community. 
and that is where the, the shopping centre or the, the town centre will end up again. Um, and the shopping centres of the future, um, and I'm talking future is in very short term future, they're going to need to find alternatives for redundant retail space. So they're going to need to, to, to create this hyper local market, which will include things like serviced offices, co-working space. If you go to Chadston, you see a number of uh, co-working spaces actually within the mall, or just off the mall. You will get um, concepts like mini hotels with training facilities and cooking schools where people are staying and, and learning and even education campuses uh, around shopping centres. As I alluded to, outgoings are going to need to be reimagined. Um, Statute charges need to change. Energy efficiency, smart buildings is going to be key. And changing trading hours, I believe, will be inevitable to keep the landlord and tenants costs at a sustainable level. I see much more collaboration between landlords and tenants. They'll be sharing resources and e-commerce, even ownership. And the, the, the landlords will increasingly become technology players. Uh, there are a number of landlords who are already investing heavily in e-commerce and they're, they're offering their SMEs an e-commerce platform through the shopping center. There'll be increasing facilita facilitation on BOPUS, click and collect, and, and lock of pickup. And lastly, um, the, the leasing strategies, um, although, as I said, I don't see them uh, leasing agents and uh, managers going pure um, turnover based, but I see a much greater alignment between rent and retail occupancy costs going forward and occupancy cost ratios will become uh, much more of a tool for the, the landlord to actually uh, benchmark and gauge. Uh, so that's much more of an alignment um, around the, the costs of doing business for the retailer. So that's where I, I see the, the, uh, the market going. Um, it's compressed. Uh, but it's critical that uh, retailers and landlords start planning this um, so that we can get out of this um, particular, uh, I would call it a crisis, and get back to creating what is a fantastic industry for, for all participants. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. That's uh, really appreciated and some, some really good food for thought there, I think, and very much like you said, aligned with the, the research that we've been doing. So um, great to hear that we're all saying the same thing. Um, just quickly, one uh, another question in our poll as we move on to our next speaker. And so I'd like to welcome Belinda McPhee. Um, HR Consulting Director from uh, Track Scar, um, Scarlet HR. And so Belinda's going to give us a bit of an update on HR matters and benefits that we've seen through um, the government. So welcome, Belinda. Thanks so much, everyone. So just in terms of some key updates, obviously there's lots happening in the coming weeks on the JobKeeper front. So I just thought I'd touch on that. And Joel will obviously go into the mechanics a little bit more, and then just also talk about some common themes and considerations. So Dominique obviously gave some great insights and Stephen did in terms of the whole well, well, um, wellbeing, workplace health and safety initiatives. But um, I just thought I'd cover off some of the key changes and updates for you all. So if we move to the next slide, please, Anastasia. Thank you. So for those of you that may not be aware, there were some changes to uh, the first JobKeeper scheme, which were announced in early August. So some of the changes related to changing some of the eligibility criteria for some of the staff who were not able to participate in JobKeeper for the first round. So you may recall that the eligibility criteria was that staff members needed to be employed um, from 1 March, so prior to 1 March 2020. And what's happened obviously with um, everything that, with Victoria, with lockdown, the government made an amendment to allow 
additional employees to become eligible. So team members that were employed between 1 March and 1 July were actually able to be added into the scheme. The only downside was that the notice, notice to the ATO and for your reporting needed to be done by the 24th of August. So for those of you that haven't taken advantage of that initiative, you might have missed the boat. But the good news was it actually allowed a lot of businesses to add in new team members who weren't eligible for the scheme to at least take advantage of some subsidy for the months of August and for September. So the rest of the JobKeeper scheme for JobKeeper um, version one is still the same, but just wanted to share that update with you for those that may not have been aware of that. In terms of JobKeeper 2.0, so obviously the, the bill is in Parliament and being debated this week. So as discussed last time, the changes that were announced on the 21st of July still remain in place. So from the 28th of September, there will be a two-tiered payment structure. So the first round of payments from 28 September until 3 January will be the reduction from the 1500 per fortnight to a two-tiered program, which will be $1,200 per fortnight for team members who have hours over 20 hours uh, per week, and then the reduced rate for casuals or part-timers who work less than 20 hours of 750 per fortnight. And then again, um, winding that back slightly from the 4th of January to the 28th of March. So again, the top tier receiving 1,000 per fortnight and the bottom tier receiving 650 per fortnight. So um, there's been a lot of debate and speculation, particularly from the opposition around potentially lobbying against the lower tier categories to keep everyone at the T1, being the reduction to 1,200 and the reduction to 1,000 per fortnight, but that's going to be um, debated in Parliament and we should have an update by the end of this week. So in terms of the operation of the scheme, obviously there's a whole um, host of new qualifying business criteria, which I know Joel will touch on, but that, that'll be from the 28th of September until the 28th of March. And again, the ATO is administering the JobKeeper um, payments. And so there's a lot of great information on the, on the Treasury website and also the ATO website for everything to do with JobKeeper 2.0. So I just thought it would be worthwhile just to retouch on the eligibility criteria for JobKeeper 2.0. So there's similarity to uh, the first JobKeeper scheme. So the team member essentially needs to be employed or stood down for the qualifying period. And the team member needs to be employed from the 1st of July, 2020. And for casuals that are deemed to be long-term regular and systematic, they need to have been regular and systematic as at the 1st of July. And obviously, again, similar to the first scheme, they have to nominate which is their core employer to be eligible. The age criteria still remains, as is the current scheme. So the team members um, need to be 18 years or over. And if they're 16 or 17 and show that they're independent and not studying, they also meet the eligibility criteria. As in line with the first scheme, the team members need to be at Australian residents for tax purposes and um, also the subclass 444 visa uh, team members will also be eligible. And the same with the current scheme, there's no double dipping with any other benefit. So anyone who's paid under the government parental leave or dad and partner pay scheme won't be eligible to participate in JobKeeper if they're receiving that payment. And then um, also anyone who's under Australian workers' compensation law who's, um, who has a paid workers' compensation claim won't be able to double dip either. And as I mentioned, it's only one, um, one employer per employee, employee that can be claimed. So something else that's important to note is the JobKeeper enabling directions will also be changed. So the JobKeeper enabling directions have actually, um, they will be scaled back. So what will happen is for businesses that are able to still claim JobKeeper, they're able to fulfill and follow the JobKeeper enabling principles that Fair Work Australia have set out. But there's also um, the inclusion of a reduction of turnover. So for businesses that have a 10% reduction of turnover and therefore technically don't qualify for JobKeeper, they will still able, would be able to apply some of the JobKeeper enabling directions to a slightly um, more watered down effect. So they'll be known as what's called legacy employers if they can still show a 10% reduction in turnover for the designated quarter. And that obviously needs to be determined by an eligible financial services provider. 
And in terms of the JobKeeper enabling directions, the, the whole spirit and notion is that the direction can't be what's called reckless or unfavorable or unfair. And so examples are you can't target one person versus another. That, that has to be obviously considered and, and, and spread out. And so an, an example as well is that um, there'll be a floor limit of reducing hours to 60%, whereas for people that are under you know, full um, job keeper at the moment, hours can be reduced to zero. So there's gonna be some partially watering down. And this is only for businesses who aren't qualifying for JobKeeper, but will be deemed to be legacy employers, where they have a 10% reduction in turnover. All of the other provisions, um, Fair Work, are still keeping in place for JobKeeper for, for businesses that are able to um, qualify. And the other key um, point to note is that the notification of any change will need to be seven days in writing. At the moment, it's currently two days. So that's all about to change on the 28th of September. And of course, the JobKeeper enabling directions are temporary um, whilst the program is in place until March 2021. So it's not going to be at this stage a formal change to the Industrial Relations Framework and the Fair Work Act. But as Dominic mentioned, with some of the committees that Parliament are working with um, the government's working with industry groups, there could be some reform around that in the future. But that's the um, direction at this point. In terms of work, workplace health and safety updates, Safe Work Australia have actually launched some screening guidelines for taking people's um, temperature in the workplace. So Kathmandu, um, obviously Stephen mentioned that they were one of the pioneers in doing that, as is Apple and Uniqlo and a few other businesses. But there are some um, requirements that employers need to take when you're actually temperature screening. So that information can be um, reviewed on the Safe Work website. And it's important to note that even though temperature checks are taken, it still doesn't obviously confirm that someone does have a COVID case because again, the, temp the thermometer could be out or someone could have taken medication to obviously reduce temperature. So it is just something to be mindful of. And of course, businesses still must have their COVID safety plans in place and make sure they're doing regular risk assessments for compliance. As Dominic mentioned, that employers will be liable if there's a workplace um, transmission of COVID and if someone falls ill. So it's really important for workplaces to make sure that they're fully up to date with their COVID safe plans, particularly as Victoria comes out of lockdown in the coming weeks. In terms of some of the restrictions, across each of the states. Um, Victoria, as we know, is still under stage four until Sunday the 13th. There's going to be some announcements this weekend around the roadmap out of those restrictions. But certainly, um, Dan Andrews has said last night in the media that the um, ways of working in terms of having the majority of um, workers where they can work from home will still be in place. And what we're not sure of is whether the workplace permit process will remain in place. But in the meantime, um, as some of you may or may not be aware, a workplace permit is required and the employer needs to obviously make sure that the employee has that from the Department of Justice in Victoria. And something else the Victorian government has announced is wellbeing and mental health support that's run through um, St John's Ambulance. So a free service for businesses, um, particularly targeting small to medium businesses and their workers, where they can't afford things such as EAP programs, which can be, you know, a, a cost and expensive to businesses, providing all that additional support. And also a reminder that face coverings re remain mandatory in Victoria. Some other updates to note is pandemic leave, um, disaster payment was announced for Victoria. So that's in place up until tomorrow. And given the fact that um, the state is still in lockdown, we will find out tomorrow whether or not there'll be extension of, of that benefit for people who don't qualify for any other payment elsewhere. For those that have businesses in New Zealand, um, New Zealand positively moved from its alert level three to alert level two on the weekend, uh, which is great. But there is still some extra restrictions in, in Auckland, not related to the workplace, but related to gatherings and funerals, which remain in place until this weekend. And it's important to note that businesses are allowed to open as are retailers, um, but it's important to in ensure that the WorkSafe plans for COVID are in place. And for retail, uh, social distancing in New Zealand is two metres, whereas regular social distancing for general business is one metre, so that needs to be complied with. 
Just some other points to note in terms of some updates across different um, legislative elements. So the High Court has overturned a decision on personal leave entitlements. So in August 2019, there was a decision around how personal leave should be calculated. And a number of businesses obviously followed that lead and made that change. That decision has just been reversed. And so calculating personal leave at 10 days per year um, is still calculated on the one over 26 method. So that was the original um, decision that was made before it was overturned last year. So for most businesses, there's nothing that they need to do, but it might be imp important to note and discuss with your um, payroll teams ex internally or externally, just to make sure that you're covered and that you've adjusted any of your leave accruals to follow this new ruling. And also in terms of the General Retail Industry Award, the unpaid pandemic leave and annual leave on half pay was extended. It was meant to expire on the 31st of July and it's now been extended until the 30th of September. So that's just something else to note as well. And just in terms of some other consideration and trends, with obviously the success of people working remotely who can work remotely, a lot of businesses are now wanting to take the notion of extending their working from home policies to cover again beyond lockdown situa uh, situations. So a lot of um, businesses who might be in the recruitment process, um, I'm certainly getting a lot of conversations and questions asked from people joining new businesses, whether there are, you know, really good extensive working from home policies um, outside of the lockdown arrangements. So that's something that's becoming, um, I, I guess, more and more prominent and the norm as opposed to just dealing with um, an emergency situation. And as um, Stephen mentioned, with all the great work that Kathmandu are doing, there's some great case studies and research that's coming out about best employers, both within Australia and overseas, about keeping people feeling safe, secure and appreciated. So again, that's the, the theme that Stephen spoke about. And that's what we're seeing in terms of best employers um, doing both locally and globally. And another consideration just to be mindful of is in terms of performance and salary reviews, a lot of businesses have taken the decision to defer that process. Naturally, the minimum award increases you have to pass on and that's mandatory. But in terms of those formal processes, businesses are obviously assessing what's happening and looking to push those out to the new year and um, make sure that those are in place. So yeah, that's just a general update and thank you all for your time and best wishes. Thanks, Belinda. That was a fantastic, great update and yeah, some changes there that maybe people weren't too aware of as well. So um, great to hear. Um, again, just launched a quick poll as we welcome our final speaker. So welcome Joel Hummel, um, who will take us through some other government changes with regards to um, what, what's on offer. Um, Joel's from Wheeler Grenfell, so Passing over to you, Joel. Thanks, Anastasia. Uh, so uh, we're just going to quickly run through today um, the instant asset write-off, that tax deduction up to 150,000. Um, your cash flow boost too, another 50,000 in pay as you go withholding offsets, and the job keeper. Change some quick changes, and the ATO is moving to audit the recipients. So on slide two there. We've got the um, instant asset write-off. It has been extended, which is great news, to the 31st of December, 2020 for Christmas. So this means any business with turnover under 500 million can claim an immediate deduction for the cost of any new asset purchased where that asset costs less than 150,000. So remember this concession can be claimed for multiple assets as long as each asset individually costs under 150 grand. So please remember for cars, which are designed to carry passengers, your sedans and your hatchbacks, they will still be subject to the car depreciation limit being 59 grand for the 2021 financial year. On slide three, from the 1st of January 2021, the instant asset write-off, it should revert back to its original form being uh, for businesses with a turnover under 10 million and a maximum asset cost of $1,000. But there are hopes the government will introduce in its budget in October this year a further extension of this 150,000 threshold amount. If not that, then, you know, 50 or 25. Um, that's what our hopes are. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. Uh, moving on to the cash flow boost. So 
Slide four, we've got the cash flow boost twos now being rolled out. So just a quick recap, uh, the government has been automatically crediting eligible, eligible businesses, their pay as you go withholding amounts, your tax on your salaries um, of up to $50,000. And this is automatically applicable to businesses who employ staff with a turnover under 50 million. So the cash flow boost two is delivered as credits to the business ATO activity statement account. Um, so it should be automatic. On slide five, I just wanted to run you through uh, what you should be seeing on lodgement of your June bass and your July bass, which are currently the bass is being lodged. So on the June bass, the quarterly pay-as-you-go withholders, they should be receiving a credit of an amount of 50% of the first cash flow boost they received. For example, on the March and June bass, if you received $20,000 combined from cash flow boost one, you should receive a further credit of $20,000 for cash flow boost two, being $10,000 for the June bass and a second 10,000 on the September quarter bass. On the June bass and July bass for monthly lodges, you should receive 25% of the cash flow boost for cash flow boost one for each bass lodged and a further 25% of the cash flow boost will be received on the August bass and the final 25% on the September bass. So the monthly bass lodges receive cash flow boost two in four payments on the June, July, August and September bass, while the quarterly lodges receive cash flow boost two in two payments on the June bass and the September bass. Um, on slide six there, the ATO have also confirmed pay as you go withholding on personal services income is eligible for the cash flow boost. They've already been doing this anyway, but they've just confirmed it in writing. Uh, the good news is with the cash flow boost, um, you do not need to pay tax on it um, or, and it's not subject to GST. So remember you don't have to pay tax on it. So for those preparing their 2020 tax returns, the cash flow boost is not a ca taxable item. Um, on slide seven there, a word of warning. The Commission of Taxation has the ATO in review mode now, and it's looking closely at employers who enter schemes in order to gain or maximise their cash flow boost. This includes artificially restructuring your business to gain access to the cash flow boost by, you know, making changes to the character of payments by reclassing them to salary or wages, um, like payments to subcontractors or dividends being reclassed to wages, for example, or inflating your reported pay-as-you-go withholding amounts to maximise the cash flow boost amount. So any entity found to be entering into such a scheme will not be eligible for the cash flow boost. And uh, you'll be required to pay it back. We've had at least four inqu inquiries from the HO, kind of mini reviews of our clients. So there's definitely activity there. Um, these reviews have not been, they've not been aggressive, um, but where the ATO officer performing the review feel that there's a large fluctuation from what's gone on historically, they're asking employers to repay the cash flow boost they've received unless they've got a very good explanation. On slide eight, uh, important note, if you are entitled, yep, thanks Anastasia, that if you're entitled um, to the cash flow boost two, particularly on your August and September basses, make sure you do not cancel your pay as you go withholding registration. I understand that times are tough and people might be restructuring their business or want, even wanting your business down a bit. Um, so just make sure you don't cancel your pay as you go withholding registration until your final cash flow boost payment has, re has been received on your September BAS because um, cancelling your pay as you go withholding registration before that might make you ineligible to receive that final cash flow boost payment. On slide nine, we've just got um, the email address and number for the tax office in case you have not automatically received your cash flow boost too. On slide 10, we're moving on to the JobKeeper. Um, Blinders covered off on this um, excellently. So I'll just again emphasize that um, that change where current employees, um, if on the payroll by the 1st of July 2020, they can be added now to your eligible JobKeeper list. Uh, this is a, that's a great change um, as formerly an employee had to be employed by the 1st of March, right? Um, it would have been great if that was announced in June. So people, you know, all our retailers watching out there could have um, made their plans and employed new staff, but we'll take what we can get, I guess. Um, slide 11, um, we're returning, returning to the turnover test. Um, so we know that um, we've got the JobKeeper phase one ending 
in September and then the phase phase two being October, November and December is going to commence. Um, previously the eligibility for um, October, November, December was going to based on, be based on businesses demonstrating a 30% downturn in annual GST turnover, not only in the June 2020 quarter, but also in the September 2020 quarter as compared to those same quarters last year. So it was going to be a six month downturn in turnover test to be passed really. Um, now the good news is the government has announced that businesses will qualify for JobKeeper in October, November and December if their turnover is down 30%. Uh, when just comparing the September 2020 quarter to the September 2019 quarter. So it's, it's a small change, but it's a, it's a good one. On slide 12, um, yeah, the I wanted to talk just briefly about the JobKeeper bridging loans. They're still out there. So for any employers having trouble qualifying for JobKeeper because they are unable to raise the funds um, to pay all eligible employees up front the $1,500 um, per fortnight that was required, the Commission of Taxation has extended the arrangement where um, he has with the banks with regards to bridging finance. Uh, this means that any employer who cannot themselves raise the money to pay the eligible employees the upfront $1,500 payments, you can contact the, the bank for a JobKeeper bridging loan. Now the Commissioner of Taxation will then confirm to the bank that the business has applied for and will receive the JobKeeper payments. Therefore, you're effectively notifying the bank that the ATO is backing the loan, in a sense, via JobKeeper payments. And this deal between the Commissioner and the Australian banks originally ended on 22nd of May, however, it's been extended indefinitely. Um, on slide 13, um, the JobKeeper, what to do if your figures weren't down 30%. So originally, to qualify for, to qualify for JobKeeper, a business had to have an incre a decrease in projected turnover of at least 30% when compared to 2019. So some businesses applied and received JobKeeper on the basis that their projected turnover for the upcoming month or quarter was down 30%. However, following the month or quarter, some businesses found that the actual turnover did not quite drop 30%. For example, the turnover was actually down 28% or 26%. Um, now, the big question is, will that affect your JobKeeper payments? Um, do you need to repay them? Um, the answer at the moment is no. So certainly we are hoping for further practice guidelines and feedback from the ATL on what happens when you're down 26% or 24%. It's still very serious decline for any business, um, but it's not technically 30%. So we'll, hopefully the ATO will be flexible, quite flexible on that. Um, continue on to slide 14. Uh, the ATO have indicated that as long as the employer has made a good faith estimate regarding the turnover, their eligibility for JobKeeper will not be affected. So for example, the ATO have confirmed that a business's JobKeeper eligibility will not be affected if back in March, they in good faith estimated a downturn of 35%, for example, only to find that at the end of June, the actual decrease was only 29%. The ATO has got no problem with that. Uh, so what we do recommend is that business owners revisit their original projected turnover calculations and where they've projected the turnover, they make a note regarding any discrepancies with their actual turnover. So for example, in many cases, there might be one product line which you may have excelled and thrown the turnover projection out during this COVID epidemic. So this should be noted in your records. And so if your JobKeeper is reviewed by the ATO, it can be explained easily why the projection was not quite correct. Um, finally on slide 15, um, the ATO are moving to reviewing the JobKeeper payments along with the cash flow boost um, and in particular, employer's eligibility. Um, and where they see a business, where they feel is manipulating their turnover in order to satisfy the client turnover test, um, they're, they're taking a closer look. Um, so they've gone taken this even further. Um, they've indicated that they're currently investigating businesses who have engaged in schemes whereby they defer, reduce or waive payments to a supplier. So the supplier qualifies for JobKeeper. So the ATO have indicated that if they find such a case, both businesses may be audited and have their JobKeeper eligibility removed. So just be careful because I know we're coming up to having to pass this, a test again for JobKeeper for October, November and December. There's a lot of pressure and anxiety on employers. So be careful because the ATO intends to carry out some reviews there. So just, just be careful on it. 
Um, thanks. That's all for today. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, Joel. That was uh, really appreciated and a nice and succinct summary of what's going on there. Um, fantastic. So we're coming to the end of our webinar this morning. Um, we have a, a couple of minutes left over, so we will open it up to any questions. We've had a, a couple come through. Um, so for our panelists, we will see we have just got a quick poll going out. And then if anyone's got any further questions, you can put it in the Q&A section. Um, also, we will share the, the deck and we will share the recording um, with our community after the event later today. Um, and if you've got any further questions that you don't want to share publicly or that you think of afterwards, feel free to reach out um, to us. We've got our emails on the screen at the moment or to any of our panellists. Um, always happy to take questions. Um, so fantastic. So if we open it up to our panelists on the floor and any questions that we have here, um, I'll let Brian start and then I'll bring my questions from the audience. I just want to thank everyone that's State of the Nation. And what's really important is that we've kept through your efforts uh, up to date with the market, ahead of the market in many examples, and really communicating. So we're grateful. It's a wonderful service to everyone. So, so thank you. And particularly with busy lives and a lot going on. I think what was interesting around um, Joel's work today and, and Belinda's work was breaking down the complexity. And through our website, we'll make sure that uh, all these good people are contactable and you can get directly in touch with them. And I think that's a really important part of what we do here. So with great thanks, Simon, great work on thinking through the future. Got me thinking about State of the Nation 8 and how we sort of really take this position of navigation, so compliments there. Um, Stephen, great cold face stuff, really important. Um, so crucial with the learnings and lessons. And as simple as they sound, they're complex to manage across the channel of your size. So uh, our gratitude and appreciation for your work there and um, for a wonderful Christmas trading period in particular. Um, and Dom's had to move on, but uh, obviously delighted she's our chair. And um, a lot more to come from retail, Dr. Group, with the support of everyone. I think I'll pass to the questions, and that's my way of thanking everyone. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, we'll keep it quick. I know most people need to dash off at 10. So there's a very quick one. Um, given that we've obviously in the insights and what you've been talking about, Simon, and um, maybe Stephen's got some points here, we're seeing um, shift away from the CBD, shift away from these large shopping centres. So do we have any insights into sort of the future of leasing or the future of changes for CBD versus suburban centres and strip shopping? Do we expect to see changes in rentals or any particular movement there? I think so. If I Simon gave a very good summary of, of that response. I think if Simon got in touch with the call, got in touch with Simon directly on the future of leases, rents, town and community centres, the future of shopping centres. I mean, I agree wholeheartedly with Simon's reflections there. Um, unless you want to add something to that, Simon? Well, I'm happy to uh, quickly answer that because um, I've just done a whole lot of work along Pitt Street Mall. Um, I think that the shopping, the there's no doubt that the CBDs are the most heavily impacted, um, but it's too early to say what will happen because we don't know uh, how the culture of the office worker will shift, whether... There is a, obviously going to be some permanent structural change to the way that office workers uh, interact with their employer, but it's too early to say what percentage um, that will be. Uh, we already, we're starting to see on Pitt Street Mall, believe it or not, there's vacancies, uh, which is the first time in, you know, two decades, there's a couple of shops that are vacant. Um, so we'll see what, what the releasing rates are there. Um, but in terms of this, the strategy going forward, I doubt very much that prime, super prime retail will uh, go down that much because uh, CBDs, I'm thinking about super prime, um, prime are more than just shop fronts. They are marketing, they are, they are a tool yeah. to basically brand. So I don't think so, but I definitely think there's going to be a move much more to the hyper-local 
which I already touched on. I think there's going to be much more focus on um, shopping centres that can fulfil uh, communities and work in and around um, within the 30 minute mark of their of their local area. So I expect to see that trend emerging um, over the next uh, several months and years. Um, but in terms of CBDs, I think it's too early to call. Definitely a reduction, but by how much, we don't know. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and we have actually been very quiet on the questions this morning. So obviously all of our panelists have actually answered everything everyone's been thinking today. <laughs> so thank you all very much for your participation. Um, really appreciate it. Um, and thanks to our audience. Great event again this morning. Um, so we will be sharing on social media um, and any questions as always get in touch with myself or any of the team. And if finally, if anyone would like more of the global retail innovation content, um, images of retailers around the world and, what, and how they're adapting, please don't hesitate. And thanks, and Anastasia, thank you very much for facilitating this morning. That's David, <laughs> oh, good. Number seven.